how it was put together, what waterfalls we used, and how I actually launched this fund at age 22. Since then, launched two other funds. We actually just recently launched a crypto hedge fund. We just raised $10 million for that fund. It's pretty awesome. And actually, it's done very well during this volatility. So at the end, actually, if you guys want to ask, ask questions, we can do questions. Love to take questions on whatever you want to talk about. But let's dive into this today. So a lot of you guys know my story a little bit. I started out um, in college. I was a super young entrepreneur hungry, probably like a lot of us, right? I was like, dude, I'm going to go make money doing whatever. So I'd hop on YouTube, I'd hop on whatever. And I'd start to watch videos on how to make tons of money on YouTube and doing whatever. So I started to do wholesaling. I wholesale two houses. I actually spoke, I speak Mandarin Chinese. I served a two-year LDS mission in Taiwan. So I, um, I speak Mandarin Chinese. So we had a Chinese tutoring company. I, I uh, tutored, we had six different teachers. We'd go tutor like dozens of kids ran that for a little bit. There was no margin. So we ended up closing that business down, but I, we did a website building business, the whole nine yards around all these businesses. And finally my dad grabbed me and he was like, Bridger, I, you got to go meet with my business partner. This guy can really help you out. And so I said, okay, I'll go meet with this guy. So I hopped on, um, uh, you know, we set up this appointment and I drove this guy's house. And again, I grew up in a very, I would say average household, middle of the tier, average, nothing bad, but nothing great either. My dad drove a car with a dent in it that was old. And that's just, we just live life. And so I, um, I drive to the guy's house and I pull up through a gated community, pull up this gorgeous, beautiful white home. It's massive. Park my car. I'm like, holy crap. Like, who's this guy's house? And I go, I go up to the door and he's got, you know, again, he's got the cars, he's got the pool in the backyard, the basketball court in the basement, like this massive home. And I go knock on the door. I'm a little nervous. And uh, the guy comes and he answers the door. And he says, Hey, Bridger, come on in. I come into his house and it's gorgeous. I walk in, there's the, you know, he's got the wine cellar, grand piano, beautiful furniture. Anyways, we come in, we sit down and we start to chat. And I start to ask him about, you know, his life and mentoring, all that kind of stuff. And I finally ask him, how did you get all of this? Like, how did you do this? And uh, funny enough, he goes, Bridger, not a lot of people ask me that question. And I was like, oh shoot, like, that's the, that's the first question I had when I walked in here was like, how do you do all this? And he says, no, no, it's fine. Um, I'll tell you. And he goes, he goes, when I was in my twenties, I was a lot like you. He goes, I started a bunch of businesses and I actually had decent success, but then he goes, then I figured out the secrets of the rich and not just the rich, but the ultra wealthy he says the ultra wealthy families of the world. I'm talking the Vanderbilts, Bloomberg, Trump, Romney, whatever family you can look at. A lot of them get their kids they send them to the best university. Sometimes they cheat to get those kids into these <laughs> into those universities. We've seen that in the news, right? But they give them these universities and then they want them to go into the fund space, whether it's private equity, hedge funds, venture capital, real estate funds, or come back home and run the family office. And he goes, this is what's produced some of the wealthiest people on planet earth. If you look at the Forbes 100 list, it is riddled with fund managers. And so, and I kind of, I kind of asked at this point, like, Yo, what is a fund? Like, what are you talking about here? And I, I, and we're gonna talk about this for a minute. I'll take questions at the end, by the way, we're gonna talk about my first fund, how we're structured the whole thing. But I, I kind of asked like, what do you mean by a fund? And he said, you know, a fund is all it is, is a pool of capital. Investors put money into that pool. People like us, smart people can gr fund managers grab from that pool of money. We go make investments. Whenever those investments make money, they flow back to the fund and get split between ourselves and our investors. And just a second, I'm actually going to pull up the, and that's what called the waterfall structure. I'm going to talk about my waterfall structure and how we did that for my funds, because this is kind of the concept. And this whole game of money is through this thing called funds. And actually, let me share my screen here for a second. So this is kind of the, some of the stuff he taught me. So I'm going to pull this open here. Um, so we're talking about the secret structure of a $10 billion fund, all right? So um, here you have, when I talked just a second ago, this is kind of what he taught me. So, and again, I'll, I'll finish the story in a second. My dad taught me a lot of this as well, but we, um, this, so when I mentioned that pool of capitalists, you have a pool of capital, your limited partnership, your fund. That's us. We, we raise money there. General partner. This is me and you. We are the fund managers. Okay. General partner is the fund manager. Limited partners is the fund. We get, um, that's our, we got our Avenger team up here. I'll talk about that in a minute. We have investors or limited partners that put money into the fund or limited partnership. Us as the general partners, we can draw from this limited partnership and go make investments. We go buy funeral homes or properties, whatever it is. Whenever those properties make money, um, they flow back to the limited partnership and then get split between the general partner and the limited partner. So kind of making sense so far. This is all governed by what we call the LPA and PPM, the limited partnership agreement and the private placement memorandum or I like to call it the Bible. Okay, this is the Bible because it governs everything going on in your fund. This governs all of the 
rules, laws, regulations. And the cool thing about funds is you get to write the Bible. Okay. You get to write the rules, regulations, all the ins and outs of your fund, which is pretty cool. Okay. I'll talk about it in a second. I have a few things here. We're going to talk about kind of my waterfall structure. And again, you write those rules in the Bible. Last thing here, you have, uh, sometimes some funds have this, a management investment advisor right here. Um, it's another, these, each box represents an entity, by the way. So you have your general partner entity. You have an investment advisor. It's also owned by the same Avenger team, your team up here. Um, and you guys control the limited partnership. Is this making sense? Hopefully I'm doing a little bit of a review for some people. This is brand new for others. All right. So going back, um, to kind of the story. Okay. So I was with this guy. He starts teaching me about funds and I was like, dude, can you be my mentor? Like, I'd love for you to mentor me. Can you teach me on this stuff? And, uh, I was like, he looks at me, he goes, Bridger. Um, he goes, go talk to your dad. He goes, your dad knows way more about this than I do. I said, no, no, no. My dad's kind of poor. He goes, you're kind of rich. I, I want to learn from you. And just so you guys are aware at the time they were managing just over $8 billion of real estate in their funds, which is crazy. Okay. Uh, to put that in perspective, you know, you have like Grant Cardone, right? 10 X. I have nothing against Grant Cardone, you know, 10 X let's go Grant Cardone. <laughs> uh, that is at the time, that's four times bigger than Cardone capital is today. And today, actually, I believe they're about 10 times bigger than Cardone capital. So 10 X, 10 X Grant Cardone. There you go. <laughs> but just crazy. Now my dad since retired, his partners moved on everything, but, um, they that business is incredible and his partners have done incredible things. And, um, but again, this is the types of funds they're running. I was like, holy crap, dude, I want to learn from, can I get a mentor? Again, this guy says, go, he's, this is my dad's business partner. He says, go talk to your dad. He knows way more about than I do. I said, no, no, no. My dad's kind of poor. You're kind of rich. And he goes, Bridger, sorry to break it to you, but, um, me and your dad make about the same amount of money. And my chin dropped to the floor. I was like, huh? Come, come again? Like what, what's going on? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, me and your, and again, this guy lives in this huge, gorgeous mansion. My dad, we live in a very average house. So my dad drives an old car with a dent in the door. And I'm like, huh? He's like, yeah. He goes, we're pretty much equal business partners, dude. And I, I left this dude's house. I drove straight to my dad's house. And I was like, dad, what the heck? What's going on? Like, why haven't I been able to order a soda at Chipotle? for the past 10 years, because it's too expensive. And yet you're managing these billion dollar funds. Like what is going on? And so anyways, <laughs> long story short, um, my dad started to mentor me and teach me and, and help me. And, and uh, every Sunday night, I'd drive to his house and get the whiteboard out and he'd coach me through what funds are. And a lot of the basis of what I teach you guys on YouTube and online here is what my dad actually taught me. And this ultimately over the next few months helped me to, it's funny when you start to learn about stuff, stuff like this stuff that I'm sharing on my screen here, you start to recognize these things in your life. You notice that? Like you, when you start to learn about something, you start to recognize it in your life. And so I started to recognize an opportunity where I could start a fund. And, uh, I, I was working at a company at the time and, um, I was an intern. So I'm in college, I'm an intern and I'm trying to start my own businesses. And I was intern at this company. I said, Oh dude, I was like, I could start a fund in this company this company needed financing for their clients. Their clients were coming through and they needed a financing product to help them for like 60 or 90 days. And so I was like, huh, I could do that. And I talked to the owners of the business. They loved the idea. I talked to my dad and the people, they loved the idea. And I thought it was so cool. We started to map out what our fund would look like and do. And so I started to put this whole thing together and I'm going to share in just a second what we actually put together, kind of the unique strategy we did. Put this whole thing together. And I'll kind of finish this story up. Then we'll get to the slides here. But I, uh, I thought it was so cool. And I was like, crap. Okay, now I got to raise money, right? I'm, I'm at the time, I'm 22 years old. I was, uh, I was like broke college. I'm like, shoot, I got to raise money. And then I thought, aha, easy. I'll go talk to my dad, right? Anybody else like in the, I was like, easy, right? I'll go talk to my dad. So I, I remember I set an appointment with my dad. I went to his home office on Sunday night, walked in, knocked on his office. And then I sat down, I started to walk him through the fund. And uh, I said, dad, I said, first off, thank you. He was a great mentor. He mentored me through everything. And I said, dad, how would you like to be our first investor into our fund? And uh, my dad kind of smiled and laughed at me. And he said, Bridger, um, I have the money to invest. But if I invest in your fund, it would ruin the experience of you raising money on your own. And he said, no. And uh, he said, this will, if, you, if I give you money now, it will be a crutch that you'll never be able to recover from. Your first investor is your hardest investor to find. You need to do this on your own. And I was like, shoot, okay. And he kicked me out and I kind of walked out with my tail between my legs a little bit. And um, I went out and I, uh, I took him up on the offer. I hit the streets. I talked to everybody I knew, like literally everybody I knew. I, I talked to former college professors, bosses. 
I talked to neighbors, anybody I could find. And I raised a whopping $49,500 for my first little micro fund. And uh, now this, I know that sounds small. It's teeny. So again, back to the fund. There's this little micro fund. I raised $49,000 in this little limited partnership we just set up. I actually didn't have an investment advisor. I just had, I'll share in a second. Let's see if I can go here. I just had this. Okay. And, uh, we set up our little LPM PPM and uh, we got that first group investor. I got them a 64% return on their money, which was insane. Okay. And again, small money amount. We only had a $49,000, but huge return, 64% return, which is awesome. So I, uh, we closed that little syndicate. It was a kind of a syndicate fund down. We then launched this a bigger fund with the same strategy. That fund, we raised and deployed millions of dollars out of that fund. I ran that fund for about man, I think three and a half years, four years. And then um, just about two years ago, we had a competitor or a year ago, a competitor come in and buy us out. So a competitor came and gave us an offer, bought our entire fund out, which is so cool. We exited a fund. We can talk about that in a minute during the Q and A if you guys want. And then um, we started this company called Investment Fund Secrets or Fund Launch. We've rebranded to. We now said, hey, let's help other people learn how funds work. So between my dad, myself, my brothers, a former uh, lawyer at the largest law firm in the world, okay, built funds, huge multi-billion dollar funds, all the legal structure. So we started to make all these types of videos and stuff for you guys to help more people launch funds. Then recently, we I just launched another fund, a, a hedge fund now, so tr transitioning to different space, a hedge fund. Um, we just raised $10 million for that fund. And now I'm actually a partner on six different funds. I'm a minority partner, a small partner, but I'm a partner on six different funds between real estate, dental practices across the board. We have all these cool funds that I'm partners on now. So now seven, I think total with my own fund um, that I run there. So it's kind of cool. So um, with all that, let's dive in. You guys cool? Give me like a yes in the chat if you guys are ready to dive into this. So I want to talk to you guys about the structure that we put together for our fund. Now, a lot of people ask me the question, Bridger, how do fund managers make money? What, what's kind of the money? How does it all work? So let me break it down for you guys here. I need to see some yeses. Any yeses? <laughs> like this video too. If you, it helps it boost it on the algorithm a little bit, it helps more people see it if you guys can as well. Um, but let's talk about the breakdown of waterfall structure here. Okay. So on the left here, this is what you're seeing on your screen is what I like to call the timeline of kind of returns. All right. If, if that's a good way to say it. So you have a 0%, I'm going to use IRR, just you could say 0% return here, 10% return, 20% return, okay? So most funds will charge, if you heard of a 2 and 20, that's a lot of funds will do that. So they'll charge a 2% management fee. So 2% is taken off before you make any returns. Like this is a management fee just for managing the money. A lot of funds, so again, right here, that goes to the investment advisor management fee. You see it highlighted there. Both of these, by the way, they're both owned by you though. So don't get too tied up in where the fees go, but both these, the investment advisor and general partner are owned by you. Well, so we can pull out the whiteboard in a minute and talk more about the differences there, but they're both owned by you. But anyways, um, you have a management fee, 2%. Then uh, with our fund, we did an 8% pref. Okay, so this is a preferential rate of return. And this goes, I'm gonna put the, so the top, anything on the top of this screen is gonna go to us as the fund managers. The bottom goes to the investor. So what I would pitch an investor, I'd say, hey, when you invest with me, the first 8% of all returns go to you directly. All right. Like I, I don't make a dime and we actually, I'll start a minute. We didn't have management fees, but most funds do this. Um, you know, any returns, all, first 8% goes to you. Only after you make an 8% return, then I start making some money. Okay. So and if we made a 7% this year, I would take zero. You take all of it. Okay. So, and then, um, is that kind of making sense? Is that following along a little bit? The next tier we did, so that's called your PREF. And these are these are terms you can use for your fund, your PREF, your rate of return. Next, we had what's called a catch-up. So this is, again, a, that's a technical term you can use in funds called a catch-up. We did a 2% catch-up to the general partner. So again, 8% uh, PREF, 2%. So let me put a line here. But any return, so if we got a 10% return this year, the first 8% would go to the investors. 2% would come to us as the fund manager, okay? Now above there, we did an 80-20 split. So let's just say in this example, we got a 22% return on our fund. We would then do an 80-20 split from 10% IRR to 22. Does that make sense? So 80-20, 80% of the investors, 20% to us as the fund managers. So if you do the math there, 80% from here to here would be 9.8% and then 22 would go to us. Again, the top is us, the fund managers. The bottom is the investors, okay? So if you total this out, this would be a 6.2% return to you total and a 17.8% return to the investors. 
on a 22% IRR after fee. So after the fee is taken out, you got a 22% for the year. Okay. Is that kind of making sense? You following along so far? Now you might be saying, well, Bridger, that's so small, dude. I'm not in the business to six, 6.2%. 6 that's all we make. You got to remember this is not six point. So these guys got 17.8% return on their invested capital. So if you put a hundred grand in, you would have made 17.8% this year on this example. 6.2% though is on the entire fund. So if you had a hundred, um, a $10 million fund, that would be $620,000 that you made as the manager of the fund. If it was a $100 million fund, that would be $6.2 million or about $500,000 a month you would be making running this. If it was a billion dollar fund, $62 million in one year, almost over a million dollars a week you would make on a billion dollar fund. A $10 billion fund, <laughs> keep doing the math, $620 million. Okay. Over 10 million a week. That's over a million dollars a day. You'd be making on a 10. So you do the math, these big hedge fund managers that manage $10 million, excuse me, 10 billion with a B. A lot of them are making, if they make something like this, which is a pretty, I mean, standard return for a, a, a performing hedge fund, a good performing hedge fund, they're making over a million dollars a day. What? Okay. That's why funds are so cool. Uh, cause you make lots of money, but also because you can change the world, do lots of cool things, but cause that making sense. Does any questions on this waterfall structure, how this kind of works? Okay. So over here, this right here, um, if you guys can see my mouse, the catch up and the carried interest is what they call performance fees. This would be classified as you performed in the fund over here on the left would be called a management fee. Cause it's just a fee for managing the fund. So just so you guys are aware the carried interest or performance fees go to the general partner and any management fees would go to your management company or investment advisor. We talk about the differences there um, here. Is that kind of making sense? Yeah. You guys following along? Um, let me check the chat real quick. I just want to make sure this makes sense. Let's go. Yes. Yeah. That's why funds are freaking cool. Okay. Um, and this is why I wanted to get into funds so bad. If you guys remember like my story a minute ago, I heard this about funds and I, I remember saying, I don't care if it takes me one year, five years, or 20 years. I was going to learn what a fund was, how funds work and how they're put together. And so, and that's what this guy said too. He's like, I, you know what? A lot and funds are a big deal. Just so you're aware funds, funds, like uh, this is not some get rich quick scheme. Funds take time. It's legacy. It's long-term, but when you do it right, you make huge amounts of money. It's funny enough. A lot of people used to fall online. Actually, Mr. Beast just launched a fund to invest in creators. Ty Lopez launched a fund. Obviously, Grant Cardone has funds. I spoke at Ryan Pineda's event last week. He's launching funds. Oh, most people that are successful in business or finance one day or another end up in the fund world, which is so cool. Okay. Can I get a ura on the chat? Kind of cool, right? Let's go to the next tier. So I want to share with you guys case study for my first fund, Blackbridge Holdings. We actually, and this is the fund that I sold. So we had a competitor come and buy us out about, I think it was, man, what is it? 18 months ago, something like that. They came and bought us out. We could talk about actually, by the way, selling a fund. Um, this is what we did though. So again, I shared this example. This is not what we did though. This is a standard. Most funds do this. What we did was a little different. Okay. And again, I mentioned this earlier on the LP and PPM, you write the Bible. Okay. You can write the Bible. Um, you write the LPA, the PPM, you can, and those, when I say the Bible, these are the laws, the covenants of your fund. Think about actually writing the Bible. If you were like Moses and wrote the 10 commandments, okay, and you had God tell you to write the commandment, whatever it is, but let's say you write, we just wrote a, uh, the Bible today. You can come up with whatever you want for your fund, but once you write it, it's in its law. Like it's there. You can't go back and change it or break it. Does that make sense? That's what we call it. The Bible is once it's written, it's written, but before it's written, you can change it and make it malleable and whatever you need. Does that kind of make sense? So let me show you how we wrote our Bible for Blackbridge Holdings. Sound good? Yeah. Oh, let me check the chat here. Sound good. Okay. I'm getting some ooh in the chat. Yeah. If you guys like this, by the way, it puts it up. I guess it puts it up in the algorithm on wherever you guys are watching this. It helps more people see this in the group. So, all right. So here we are. This is what I do. I didn't have the investment advisor. I just had a general partner. Okay. And what I didn't do also, I did not charge management fees. Okay. So I, instead of doing what I said before, I said zero management fees. What I would pitch investors, I would say, Hey, um, you don't, I don't make money unless you make at least 8% first. I literally make $0. So I was, when I was pitching those investors, I raised that first $49,000. Hey, 
hey, investor, I make zero dollars unless you make 8% first. After eight, I'll make the next two. So the ninth and 10th percentile go to me. Above there, we'll do an 80-20 split until I get you a 20% IRR. Once we get 20, can you guys follow along? See that switch I just did there? 80-20 split until a 20 IRR. And then above that, I'm going to do a 50-50 split with you. So I make less money up front, but if we, pro- I'm, I'm incentivized to perform well and get really high returns. And so I mentioned before, we got a 64% return on our first fund. Okay. So again, first 8% went to my investors. Next 2% came to me. We then split 80, 20 between 10 and 20. So 8% to them, 22% to me. And then we split from 20 to 64. We split 50, 50. Kind of cool, right? Pretty awesome. Isn't that kind of cool? So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the route we did. Now you can change and tweak these models however you want. Some guys do a 7% prep. Some gals do a 3% management fee. Okay. Whatever you want to do, you can, again, you write the Bible, which is pretty cool. Now, let me explain to you a few things though, that we kind of feedback pros and cons. I'm not saying this is the right way to do it. We actually, some investors love this model, especially for a first time fund. I liked it a lot. Cause it was like, Hey, I'm a first time fund manager. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I don't make any money unless you make money first. Now we had some investors actually say, Hey, I want to pay you in a management fee. I actually want to pay you this because it keeps the light on, keeps you incentivized in case we lose money. So that's a good point. Other people said, just, just so you're aware, Hey, Bridger, this incentivizes you to take bigger risks because you get paid on this 50, 50 split. That's really high and, and long. And so because of that, you're incentivized to take more risk and you might lose more money again. So th- these are some of the negative feedback that I got on it. Anyways, it did well for us. We raised a lot of money doing this and it was great. My current fund that I manage right now. So this is the fund. Again, I sold this fund about two years ago. The fund I do right now, um, we actually um, just do a, we do a 2% management fee and then just straight 80, 20. And we run a hedge fund in crypto. So it's a little bit different. I, I would say real estate funds, private equity, usually do this more waterfall structure. With me, we just did straight 80, 20. And, it, and the reason we did it, because it made the math really easy. We had, uh, we're doing, op- we let new investors come into our fund at the end of every month. So actually, by the way, if you guys want to come to our fund or learn about it, it's called the Ugly Unicorn Fund. You can go on there. You can log on. You can hop on a call with us. We can walk through the whole thing. Okay. Uh, minimum commitment's $100,000. Um, we did it for simplicity sake because we had so many open and closed funds and we are an open-ended fund. We're not closed-ended. We can talk about that in a minute. The difference is there, but that's why we did that. But Dan, we wrote that in our Bible and that's how we do it. So kind of fun. Um, okay, let's go to this next section here. This is making sense, hopefully. I want to talk about, so I mentioned at the beginning how this runs on a huge level, a 10 or a 20 or a $30 billion fund. Um, have you guys heard of um, like Cayman Island funds or British Island funds or how those work? Luxembourg funds. You guys want to learn how they work? Dee, let's go. Okay. I'm going to explain to you guys how those work. Ready? Here we are. So again, this is the same things that we did, um, that I mentioned before, remember investment advisor, general partner, this is you guys, this is us right here at the top of the top of the tier. Um, so let's talk about how a, a large fund gets structured to just go to the crazy zones. Okay. Now we have a few students just, have you guys seen the shoes in our videos? Those are for any student that has over $10 million in their fund. Um, we have, I believe we've given out, man, I, I don't know the exact, I think it's 14. I can't remember the exact number, but we have 54 funds over a million dollars. We have uh, four funds over a hundred million and one fund over a billion dollars in our group. It's kind of cool. All private funds. It's pretty cool. So some of those, especially the, the larger ones, this is how they structure. This is big funds when you're raising from international space. Now, before I dive into this, I'm going to share some really cool stuff here. Before I do all this, this is f- usually you're doing this for international investors. This is how international funds are set up. Okay. Because anytime you in, so if I was in Korea and investing into a fund in the United States, I, at the end of the year would receive a K one, a tax return from the fund and that tax. So then I'm in Korea. I now have to file U S taxes. I've got to hire an account that knows U S law and file these taxes. And it's really frustrating to actually invest into foreign countries. However, there's a lot of investors that are foreign. So how do you do it? How do you bridge the gap? If you're trying to raise money from around the world, you know, what do you do? And this is the structure that they do. Sound good. This is kind of pretty, this is pretty high, uh, high stuff, high, uh, high intensity stuff. This is a lot of stuff we go through in our course and other stuff like that. So, all right, here we go. 
So these, each of these circles right here represent funds. So in this example, they're going to set up three different funds based on different investor types. Okay. The first fund, 3C1, this is only for accredited investors or qualified clients. All right. Next one is for qualified purchasers. This one I'm going to share in a second is for international. I'll share what that is in a second, but let's talk about this for a second. There are, these, these show three different types of investors. I have other videos on this. I'll go through this quick, but an accredited investor has a million dollar net worth or they make $200,000 a year or $300,000 a year with a spouse. Qualified client makes 2.2 million, or excuse me, has a $2.2 million net worth, excluding their home. A qualified purchaser has a $5 million net worth, excluding their home. This is actually why a lot of regular people like me and you can't access crazy big funds because sometimes your net worth isn't high enough to get in these. I've actually recently become a qualified purchaser and it's great. Now I can access bigger and better funds. It's by law, by the SEC rules. You can't take in a 3C7 fund, we won't talk about what all that means, but you can't, mo and which is most big funds, they can't even take your money unless you have a $5 million net worth. Pretty crazy, right? And you're capped at the number of investors you have there as well. Anyways, long story. You have your L and PPM again, your Bible. These are what's called parallel funds. These funds are in parallel to each other, three different funds, but they work together. Okay. Um, and yes, yeah, somebody put in there, you can, they've changed the rules. You can take a test to become accredited. There's a few other things. Again, those are quick definitions. You can do other tests to become accredited, but still um, there's no test though to become a qualified purchaser though. Uh, it's just a credit investor, which most funds make you be a qualified purchaser, not just a credit investor. It's the, it's the tier higher than a credit investor. So all these funds would then invest down together pro rata how much money they have into a holding company. Let's just say this is real estate, for example. This real estate holding company would then buy each one of these SPEs. This represents real estate properties. Okay, so you buy real estate here, you're buying real estate here. These are a skyscraper in Dallas. This is a hundred units in Fort Worth. This is, and then all these entities, whenever they make money, the entities flow back to the holding company. And then they flow back to each one of these funds. And each one of these funds have individual investors. They all flow back to. It's kind of making sense. Again, I'm going to the crazy zone. This won't help. Most of you guys will never use this, but this is cool to understand how, you know, a $10 billion fund is structured. Okay. This is making sense so far. Um, I don't have a $10 billion fund, but I work with people in the comments. I, if you guys missed the story, maybe my dad has run, their funds are now 40 billion. And we work with people that have uh, tens of billions of dollars in their funds. So that we help them with their structuring. And also my brother um, worked at Kirkland, largest law firm in the world for funds. They structured these all the time for people. Huge. They just helped like somebody was raising 4 billion for one fund. Not their entire thing. One fund, 4 billion. I think that AUM of like 30, 40, 50 billion dollar funds. He helped structure all of them. Okay. So um, that's where if you guys, people in the chat that missed the story at the beginning, that's where this comes from. All right. That's how we know all this. Um, so how this works for international funds. You guys ready? So let's say we're raising money out of Australia or Korea or Japan or whatever in Asia. Instead of having people invest directly into these funds, because every year they have to fill out a U.S. tax return, what they do is they invest into the Cayman Islands fund or a Canada fund, Alberta, Canada, depending on, or Luxembourg fund or Bridge Virgin Islands funds. And that fund acts as a pass-through into the master LP. Does that kind of make sense? So uh, if you had uh, 15 investors from uh, Korea, just as an example, again, it's not tax advice, but let's just say Korea again, 15 investors from Korea, they would invest into the Cayman Islands fund. That fund then as one individual invests into the master LP fund here. At the end of the year, they pay, they get a K1, they pay one, they pay taxes, not, they're not avoiding taxes here. You pay one thing of taxes, but then it, freely passes through the money back to the Korean investors and they don't have to fill out U.S. tax returns that year. Does that make sense? So the reason you do it is not for the, the same amount of tax is being paid. You do it for E. So your investors don't have to individually all file all U.S. tax returns that only the Cayman Islands one tax return is filed from the Cayman Islands LP to the master LP. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, now, additionally, sometimes in a big fund, you'll, you know, you'll grab these huge one large investor over here. Let's say it's like the New York fire department pension plan, and they want to give you $500 million. So what they'll do is that these are called sidecars or special managed accounts. Well, they'll set up a whole nother fund, kind of a copy and paste of the LP and PPM just for this large investor. 
because for whatever reason, they have a bylaw that they can't invest with other funds. So you set up a special managed account and then that special managed account flows into the holding company as well. I kind of crazy. Okay, again, if that went over your head, no worries. And if you guys missed the beginning, go back. Most of us will never use it, but kind of cool to understand, right? How these big funds work. So um, now why the GPLP structure? Why do the structure? Um, why not just do an LLC or Corporation Inc.? It's because... If you, uh, if you look back, like Steve Jobs, for instance, they ran an ink at the bottom. Steve Jobs was voted out of Apple. You remember that? Steve Jobs was voted out of Apple because the money voted. What's cool about a fund is you could have the biggest, baddest investor out there. Let's say this investor has given you $100 million and they have a tax problem. Hey, Bridger, I've got, I've got problems with taxes. I, can you sell some of the real estate kind of early because I need to get paid out on my taxes. If you did an ink or a syndication, yeah, you'd probably have to pay them out. In a fund, you just, you say, sorry, I don't serve individual investors. I do what's best for the fund. Right now, the real estate properties are not ready to sell. We need to season them. And because of that, um, sorry. And they're going to moan and complain and whatever. And you're going to say, it's tough. Um, and uh, you know, the money doesn't vote. You could, they could own 99% of your fund and uh, the money doesn't vote you out. Unless you commit fraud or something else, you say, hey, I, we, unless the LP and PPM say otherwise, that's how it works. And that's why funds are amazing. Your investors don't dictate what's going on. You don't have a shareholder meeting every year and have a vote of confidence like most companies do in a fund. It's amazing. So even Steven Schwartzman runs Blackstone. They, they actually IPO'd Blackstone over 10 years ago. Still, you can't vote Steven Schwartzman or the CEO of, of Blackstone out. You can't vote him out because of partner, limited partner relationship. Isn't that kind of cool? Funds protect you like crazy, which is, which is pretty awesome. So another huge pro for why most people end up in funds is because of this. Is it kind of making sense? Um, now moving on a little bit. Um, so again, this works for real estate, stock traders, Forex, trust funds, family offices use this, venture capital uses this, debt funds, any company raising money can use this. Just pretty freaking cool. You guys can use this whole entire fund structure to go out and raise capital. So actually, let me share you with an example uh, for a second here. Let me go back. I'm going to pull up some other slides I have. So um, this kind of work. If you guys like this, by the way, um, can you guys like the video or something? Just pay, hit that like button. I think it pushes this out to more people. If you guys can, um, that'd be awesome. I'm going to share some slides. It's actually a presentation I gave last week to um, a thousand people actually in Las Vegas. It was pretty fun on stage. I gave this presentation. So um, I want to talk about how you can use this in regular companies, which is kind of cool. So we're going to share an example for e-commerce. All right, I'm set up here. Can you guys see my screen? Is this working? Boom. Does that work? You guys see my screen? How this works in e-commerce. Okay. So these are guys, this is a, I'm going to share round numbers, but a, a real example of people in our group that are doing this. Okay. So in e-commerce, so you might be asking, well, Bridger, this could work for, so I'm going to go back a little bit. This works for real estate. Um, this works for real estate or venture capital. You pool money together, you invest in a startups or, or funds, but you could use this for businesses. So let me show you this example. So e-commerce here, um, these guys raised, uh, they wanted to buy Amazon stores instead of just building Amazon stores, they went out and bought Amazon stores. So they raised 250. Oh, you're not seeing it yet. There you go. Can you see it now? Sorry, my bad. My bad. Put that on me. Can you guys see it now? Type in the chat if you guys can see it. Okay. Um, let me know if that works. I think that should work. So they have um, in e-commerce, they raised, they wanted to buy Amazon stores. They raised $250,000. And they went and pitched and bought, and again, round numbers, but out about 50 grand a piece, they bought five Amazon stores. Pretty cool, okay? So again, instead of building Amazon stores, they went and bought these stores. And again, there's a lot of people that want to sell their stores. There's these, a lot of these kids are 19 years old and like, dude, 50 grand is like, yeah, I'll take 50 grand for my store that I just built. Like, cool, I'll take it. And so what they did is they built these. They found that in a, instead of, again, they bought into these stores, Put them together. Now, these guys are good at Amazon. They know how to scale them and scale stores. They did very well. In one year, these five stores were net free cash flowing $350,000 back to investors, which is pretty cool. Okay. So, 350 grand back to investors. What they did is they said, you know what? In their LP, people in their Bible, they said, investors, we can pay you out at any time as long as we give you a 20% return. 
So they, in one year, a return per year. So they went to their investors. They paid, they paid back the entire $250,000 plus 20%. And investors were so happy. Great, man. We made 20% in one year on this thing. This is as awesome. Let's do it again. And guess what? They didn't sell any of the stores. They keep all of these stores enterprise value of about $3 million. So look at this. They... And they own them free and clear now, and they're making 350 grand net free cash flow a year to themselves. And they've paid back all their investors, all their debts, everything is paid back. Come on. Come on. That's kind of cool. Okay. <laughs> like, think of, like, this is a way that you can accelerate business very fast. So, another example these guys, I've shared this example a few times, but um, I'll share it again. These guys found they could buy mom and pop funeral homes and, and group them together, get economies of scale, and sell them for about double to private equity markets. So what they did, again, round numbers here. Let's just say, for an example, they raised $8 million. They go out and buy eight funeral homes, a million dollars a piece, okay? Group them together, they get a economy to scale, they, they lower overhead, they get them uh, profitable, all this kind of stuff. In one year, they turn around and sell that for $16 million. My buddy does this, uh, round numbers again, but he'll make, so about an $8 million profit. He takes home about $1.8 the other 6.2 goes to his investors with a great return. It's awesome return. Investors are super happy over a, what is that? Like a 60, 70% return in one year. Let's do it again next year. He makes 1.8 million a year doing that. Anybody want to do that for their career? I mean, people work, work tooth and nail for years to make 1.8 million in one year. And all he does is just buy eight funeral homes, turns around and flips them to somebody else and then makes 1.8 million a year. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. You guys follow along. Okay. Kind of cool. Another example. This is how e this is a, a example of a guy with a gun store. Okay. So this guy, he owns a gun. So if you have an existing business owner right now, you run a store, his store did five, 10 million a year in a gun store. Okay. He wanted to go buy out his competitor stores. However, he's like, I don't want to give up most of the time. You'll hear the example. Hey, okay. If you want to raise money, you got it like shark tank. You got to give away 25% of your company to Kevin O'Leary and he's going to come in and help you out. Okay. <laughs> You don't have to do that. What he did, and this is what we, we set up for him. Gun store, leave your, this, this box represents his business. Leave it by itself. Don't do anything else. Set up an external fund. That fund goes and buys your competitor stores. Five, six, seven stores in your area buys out all your competitors. You run that fund just like a normal fund. You have a, you know, 80, 20 split or whatever. And then additionally, you, your fund can hire your team, corporate team from the gun store, and maybe you pay a corporate fee of like 5% and you put your branding on their stores and you do the marketing and help them scale the stores up. You get paid a 5% fee to do that originally. Additionally, you get 20% of the profits with your investors on the fund over here. And then you get management fees as well. So you make money in three different ways on this. So we've helped people do this with gun stores, with restaurants. They have a restaurant and they go buy out all their competitors in their restaurants. Is that kind of making sense? Like, are your, are your wheels starting to spin right now? You could go to an, you don't even have to start a business. You could go to an existing business owner, say, hey, you want to grow? Everyone says, yeah, I want to grow. Hey, what if we set up a fund on the side of your business, not attached, but separate, that goes and buys your competitors or goes and opens up franchises for this store or restaurant or goes and whatever expansion project you need to do, you do it externally. You don't risk your, you, you keep your current business. Nothing, we don't even touch that. It stays the same. You launch an external venture and it does all through there. Come on. Isn't that kind of cool? People, are you guys following this? Like, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I get so excited about this. Maybe I'm just a geek about funds, but I get so excited about this because I think it's so, I think it's so cool. Okay. Um, how this is, uh, Give me some, give me like a thumbs up or a like. I need some, I need some feedback in the, in the chat here. I don't see anybody. Give me some feedback in the chat. <laughs> I need some love a little bit. Okay. Isn't this kind of cool? Like I get so excited about this. It's so fun. All right. Um, now I want to show you these next step. This, this is how it works in pretty end debt markets. All right. So, um, this is how, um, these guys, this is a true example. So my, my dad, again, he, uh, he was going to a big sec conference. So, um, talking about compliance, securities exchange commission, huge conference. So he flies up to New York. They're there with all these huge fund managers. So he sits down at a dinner table or whatever during the conference. And he starts talking to a guy next to him. And this is the guy's fund. This is what they do. So I'm going to explain to you. This fund, all they do, 
Again, I'm going to talk about working smarter, not harder. All they do is this little scenario I'm explaining to you right now. He goes, there are huge biotech companies on the left here representing a big biotech company. And they go buy a small biotech company for $5 billion over five years. And small, that's a still big biotech company, but relatively small, okay? In his opinion, it was small. Um, to me, it's like, that's massive, okay? But uh, small biotech company, okay? So what they do, um, these the small biotech company, typically, they don't want to wait five years to get paid out the $5 billion. So a billion dollars a year, they would love to get paid now. So what this fund does is they step in and they say, Hey, instead of, um, doing waiting five years, we'll pay you $4.5 billion today, right now, 4.5 billion will pay to you today. And we will collect 5 billion over the next five years. Is that kind of making sense? And they say, hey, you guys are paid out. You're good. We'll collect the payments for the next five years. That's a $500 million spread. People work their entire lives and businesses and on the top one, 0.1% of businesses ever make a hundred million a year. These guys make a hundred million a year doing that little transaction. Does that kind of make sense? And they, they also leverage this with debt so you get better returns. But he, and then my dad asked him there at the dinner. He said, yeah, well, he said, that's incredible. How much, how big's your fund? What do you, how much you guys? He goes, we currently manage $35 billion right now. 35 billion. And he goes, we're trying to raise another 40 billion because there's so much demand for this little deal. It's a debt fund. That's it. That's all they did. Their entire fund. It's a fund you've never heard of before. They're not famous, whatever. This is all they do is this little arbitrage play and they make hundreds of millions of dollars a year doing that. Come on, who wants to work something like that in the future? I mean, that's, I think that's so cool, okay? This is how it works on a broad scale. You don't have to come up with some crazy algorithm strategy. I mean, this is a pretty simple process just done with big numbers, okay? Um, is that kind of helpful, kind of cool? Um, so let me go back here. Um, let's answer some questions. I see some good questions in here, okay? So drop questions you guys have. If you guys like it, if this has been helpful so far, go like this. By the way, this is uh, saved on where you're watching it. So you guys can go, I think you can go back and watch it later, I think anyways. I think it's saved, but don't quote me on it, hopefully. But I'm here live right now. So let's answer some questions. Um, just processing all this. Hey, I'm 17 years old. Awesome. I'm a junior in college studying finance. You're 17 and you're a junior in college? Wow, that's awesome. Um, you want to come work for me? <laughs> I've been learning about head funds and private equity funds work, and I really would like to start one. You have for me. Um, my advice to anybody in the space um, that like is just in the like, I would say learn, educate yourself like crazy about funds. That's what I did. I went every week and met with my dad, and we went on the whiteboard. I I read everything I could online. I uh, and that's actually one of the reasons I we built our whole YouTube channel. We have you know, we have courses and coaching. We have all this kind of stuff. We have actually a free course on funds as well. If you go to fundlaunch.com, it's all right there. We have actually people that can hop on with you, help you put it all together. Whatever you need, anything from free all the way up to whatever you want. Lawyers, everything that come in and build it for you, we have everything. That's what we do. And so when I tell people to start out though, educate yourself like crazy. Come educate yourself on fund content and specifically on funds, how they're built. All the stuff that I explained just barely, you should be able to explain that 10 times over. And we actually have the whole course. We have everything built out in our courses and stuff. If you guys want our, we have a free course all the way up to, we have a, uh, our fund Academy. And then we have a, a coaching group that you guys fly out. We do events in person, like meet and I help you guys build your funds. Okay. Um, you can hear what my funds are doing everything. Okay. So, um, but yeah, I would educate yourself like crazy. So if you want to go there, it's fundlaunch.com. You can hop on a call with one of our advisors. You can just get the free course. You can get one of our paid stuff. You can come to our live events, whatever you want. You got it. Okay. Um, did the fund manager owner have to invest their own money also for Amazon, a funeral home? Um, so in the example I shared, no, uh, but I would, I, I tell every manager, you should invest your money alongside your investors. Every fund that I've ever done, I've invested a significant amount of money into those funds. Um, cause it's just, it's a good alignment of interest. You want your money alongside your investors. Um, now, how big of an amount of money depends on you and what your fund is, but you should have a, a, what I would say a significant amount to you put into that fund. So that, so that an investor will ask you, Hey, how much have you invested in this fund? Are you investing in this fund? And you gotta, you gotta look them square in the eyes and say, yes, I've invested in this fund. I've invested this amount of money. And so I tell every fund manager, you need to align money with investors. 
Um, okay. Other questions. I have a friend buying Amazon business. Sound like he should set up a fund and is missing out on some additional revenue streams. hundred percent. Um, the acquisition space right now is so cool that it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, what's there. Um, I want to learn leverage buyout, how I learn and acquire in businesses, how to find businesses. Yeah. We actually have in, in our Academy program, we, uh, our fund launch Academy, we have a whole section on private equity leverage buyouts, how that all works. Yeah. It's kind of fun. What are some of the biggest mistakes that may be avoidable for a new fund manager? Um, in other videos, I have a, a thing called the fund launch formula. We watch people through how to like launch funds. Um, people that don't follow that. And I saw that sounds so arrogant to say, but a lot of fund managers, um, they're, they're so excited. I'm going to start this fund. Step one, I'm going to go pay a lawyer $50,000 to build my fund for me. And so they build the fund and they go back and then they're like, okay, I got the legal docs, but now I got to raise money. And so they go try to raise money and then people don't like the fund or they go back and try to change the thesis. They don't, they don't stress test their thesis enough. And by thesis, I just mean your strategy, your, your concept for doing business. They don't test it enough. And so either they don't raise money or when they do raise money, their fund doesn't do very well. It's not very profitable. And so that's the biggest mistake I would see is they don't do it. So when we teach the fund launch formula, the fund launch formula is a four step formula. I think I actually hold up people. I might actually have it in here. Let me, um, I'm speeding through this. Let's see if I can find it. The fun launch formula. Oh yeah. It's right here. Boom. You guys are lucky. You guys are lucky. I found it. Okay. Let me share my screen. Boom. Give me one second. So, um, this is the fun launch formula. I won't go through the whole thing. You watch other videos. We talk about this four step. You find incredible deals. You frame the deal. You stress test. You put in a pitch deck. You actually go and pitch investors. You test your pitch with investors. You test your deal out. You do this. It's kind of, I should put arrows right here. It circles back and forth right here. Maybe down here I have it. Um, yeah, right here. I think I, I have this kind of stress test circle that comes through. But anyways, I'll, I'll put back to you just so it's simple. And then, then and only then you go and you launch your fund through legal docs. Now, and then this is what we teach. This is a process. We've helped uh, 120 funds in our group launch last year. 120. Isn't that crazy? Um, we help them do this whole process and we actually do the whole thing with them, but I would say do that. So, oh, I'm not even sharing my screen, dude. I'm so sorry. There it is. Can you see it now? Gosh, you guys got to tell me on the chat. There you go. Okay. Find amazing deals, frame the deal out. Number three, pitch investors. Number four, legal docs. So again, stress test that great deal, frame it out, go and pitch investors, loop this back and forth in a circle. And then, then, and only then go do legal docs. Um, there's kind of a circle right there. You kind of circle back and forth. You test all of this. And then, um, then and only then you go do legal. We've helped 120 funds do that in the last year. It's pretty fun. Okay. Thank you for the knowledge coach. I'm eager to absorb and hungry to learn. Cool. It's awesome. I have an Amazon business already profitable. Would that help me raise money? How did that person raise money to buy Amazon businesses? Yeah. So they followed the fun launch formula right here. So they went out. So just use it real life example. So Hey, we're going to go buy Amazon businesses. And you say, Hey, we have a great deal here. We're going to buy Amazon businesses. We're good at Amazon. We know how to scale them. We have all these metrics. I'm not, I don't know Amazon, but all the metrics and stuff that like you do to make Amazon great. And then you go out, you frame that together into a fund. So, Hey, like I mentioned before, we're going to, we're going to do a split an 80, 20 split, or we're going to do a 8% pref, a 20% carrot, all the stuff I described like 10 minutes ago, you frame that all out. Then you go pitch investors. And what you're trying to show investors is, this is amazing. Guys, I've scoured the earth for investment stuff to get into. We have found asymmetrical risk, which, and I'll, I'll actually share my screen here. Um, asymmetrical risk means, I'll put it right here. I think that's it. Can you guys see that one? Yeah, asymmetrical risk. All asymmetrical risk is, Oh, here it is, is a, we've been trained high risk, high reward. You guys ever heard that low risk, low reward. Um, there's a, there's a theory called the efficient market theory that essentially says that everything is already priced in perfectly. The exactly, the exact risk and reward levels, especially for a stock market are priced in perfectly. And there's no way to gain a strategic advantage yet. There are dozens of fund managers around the world that every year make 
X, the, the odds of them making above market returns are like 0.000001%. Yet they do it year after year after year. And so it's kind of like, hey, that efficient market theory doesn't make sense. What asymmetrical risk is, is where you can have relatively low risk for relatively high return. What do I mean by that? So for example, if me and you were going to go buy a business, okay? And there's a certain amount of risk associated with this business and reward, okay? And we're going to go buy it. Let's just say the risk reward level is here. However, let's see, um, what if Elon Musk was our business partner? So me, you, and Elon are going to go buy a business. What do you think the chances are of us having success are? Do they go up or down? Probably up, right? So what are, what are, especially our risk level, what is our risk level? It probably is less risky if we have Elon Musk, who's amazing at buying businesses and buying and stuff. So all of a sudden, we, it's not just high risk, high reward. It's relatively low risk for relatively high return. Is that kind of making sense? Typically, especially in funds in venture capital, in private equity, us, we are the asymmetrical risk. Think about Shark Tank. Shark Tank's a great example. You uh, In Shark Tank, people go into Shark Tank and what do they want? They want to partner with Damon John or Kevin O'Leary or Mark Cuban because it gives them, and think about it as investing on Shark Tank. You invest if I'm a shark, I'm investing. We get airtime on TV, number one. So everyone sees our product. Number two, I've got all these connections that can help this business blow up. It's, it's probably relatively low risk and pretty high return for the businesses that are invested on in Shark Tank. Does that kind of make sense? That's the concept of asymmetrical risk because you're trying to find that in whatever you're doing. So back to the example of Amazon stores, you're trying to show an investor, we have found asymmetrical risk. We have found where we can mitigate downside risk and we can have a relatively high risk return for what we're doing. Does that kind of make sense? It's a really good question. That's, that's kind of how I look at it. Um, okay. What types of funds have you seen raise the most money and easiest? Um, our, one of our student funds, uh, they've raised $8 billion in about two, two and a half years, 8 billion from zero to 8 billion. Now they, they're an anomaly. They're crazy. They actually spoke at our last event. Um, they're coming, uh, they're coming to our next, they're in our whale group. Actually, we have a whale group. That's like our top fund manager is pretty fun. Um, they're crazy. They're, they're a hedge fund primarily. So primarily trading, um, S and P 500 futures. Um, they also have a real estate arm now and a venture capital arm. Um, we've, we have, I think three funds over hundred million that have all raised in real estate. So real estate, um, one is in restaurants as well. So kind of private equity play it's across the board. It really just comes down to the manager and the, the opportunity. Um, regarding clawbacks, is it something you usually put in the legal framework agreement with limited partners? Yeah. So in your LP and PPM, your, your Bible, um, some funds have clawbacks, some don't. What, what clawback is, is, um, if you, let's say you're having a five-year fund in year one, you make tons of money and you pay yourself a performance fee, but then the next four years you have losses. Uh, what a clawback allows you to do is, and you do an average over, you'd say over five years, maybe year one, we made a hundred and we averaged over five years, a 12% return over five years. Times year one, you were paid too much um, of a performance fee. So what the investor can do is they come and rebalance your fund. They claw back some of your returns. They rebalance your fund. Similar thing um, to a high watermark. If you had a high watermark, you were paid returns up. Anyways, I have other videos. I won't explain high watermarks, but you guys can go. We can go watch my YouTube channel. We've got tons of videos and all that. But um, you can decide if you want those in your fund. It just depends on your fund. So... It's pretty standard though. And if you're going out to raise big money, they're going to want a high watermark. Um, and a, some will want clawbacks. They're going to ask for that. And they're going to want that in your documents for big funds, small funds. You can get away with doing whatever you want. Wow. I traded SP 500 full time. I used tasty works broker. How did they raise so much money? Um, they had been actually funny enough. Um, they had been teaching and tra training traders for like 20 years. These guys, so they had actually taught trading. And what they did is they put out tons of free content. If you guys wonder why I like doing content, number one, I think just more people should learn the world of funds. But then they used, they built an audience and then they, they launched their fund and they raised a ton of money from their audience. So you see what Grant Cardone's doing. All Grant Cardone, he throws big events, all the marketing and all this, hey, invest in my fund, right? Like that's what he does. He does a very good job of public marketing. Um, Right now, if you like for me, I'll be, I'll to, be totally honest. We have courses community. Number one, I want to actually, I truly do want more people to understand how funds work, how to build them hundred percent. 
But in the back of my brain too, it's like, hey, it's always good to build an audience. And if I launch a new fund or whatever, you guys be the first to hear about it. So it's pretty cool. Um, okay, great question, you guys. Um, I have got, well, let's see. Hopefully this makes sense. By the way, if you missed some of the slides at the beginning, you guys can go back. Um, we walked through all these examples, all this cool stuff. I'll share one last thing with you guys. Sound good? Let me uh, get my screen ready to go here. Boom, bada, bing. Okay. So you guys know we have some cool stuff coming up. Um, let me share my screen here. So we've got window. All right, there we go. Can you guys see my screen? Is that working? Infinity screen. There we go. <laughs> so this is funlash.com. We've got our event coming up in Miami. Um, 2,500 people. We got Ed Milet coming, Jim Rogers, co-founder of the Soros Funds. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool event we got coming up. If you guys want to get um, some of our free stuff right down here, we have any, anything from our fun launch accelerator, which is free. We have our capital games playbook, how you learn how capital works. The Academy is our full out course. Black cards, our coaching group whale group is for any fund over $10 million wants to join our whale group. Fun Launch Live um, is our big event. And then we have IFS Ventures and Black Car Capital Partners. We're actually partnering with funds, doing deals with funds, kind of our top of funnel. So uh, if you scroll down here, here's our free course, literally $0. Fun Launch Live tickets actually, I think are going up soon. So you guys can get tickets to Fun Launch Live. It's going to be crazy. Um, we have case studies here. And you can actually, if you want to hop on a call, if you click on Black Card, like our team will talk to you about if you guys want help launching your fund, whatever it is, it's all right here. And then we have Whale Group. If you want to apply for Whale Group, you can come there. YouTube channel, podcast, blog, all of our free stuff. Um, like I said before, I, I would just say, if you're new to this, just go consume. We put on purpose. Just go consume free content. And then once you join this kind of the back end of our programs, you can, can hop in here. For example, like here's our academy. We've spent a lot of money on production and making these videos good and high quality and all that kind of stuff. So you can, hear, you can kind of see how the videos look. You know, we sit down, we come here on the whiteboard. This is me and Lincoln walking through. Us us watch about funds. They're very quick videos too. We, we, I hate long videos that are drawn out seven minutes. I mean, we're quick, we're efficient. We get you right to the point. High quality studio. We edit all of our videos to make sure they're just pertinent and exactly what you need. So anyways, there you go. Funlaunch.com um, is where you go. And uh, yeah, you guys are awesome. Um, so again, tickets though are going up. So I would, fun last live is going to be freaking insane if, in Miami. Um, we got fund managers from all over the world flying in to teach and speak at fun launch live. Um, it's, uh, I love in-person events. I am a, I'm a, an event junkie because I feel like there's a, when you get immersed proximity is power. When you get around and you get to touch it and taste it and feel it, what you want and what you're going after. And you get to be around other people doing the same thing. It's at least for me, it's energetic. I launched fun launch this business because of an event. I went to an event and I got so excited. I was just like, yes, I can do this. I gave me all the tools. I have these notes. And actually we literally went home and we built fun launch, me and Mason. I'm not even joking. Um, it's pretty fun. I have built so much stuff because of events and things. And just when your mind is all on one thing and you're focused for like two days or three days on one thing, incredible stuff comes out of that. At least for me, I love being immersed. I love being all in. I'm just that type of person. And so Fun Launch Live is all in just for funds. It's not just some general business conference gonna come pump you up, make you feel good. We have we do actionable things. We talk about economics, how the fund is, world is moving, what how to raise capital, how to find investors, how to build a fund. It's like a it's like a three-day workshop intensive on investment funds and the world around investment funds, if that kind of makes sense. That's why we built this event is because there's no other event like it on planet earth. Literally zero events like it on planet earth. We are so unique. I of one type of event. Um, so go to fundlaunch.com um, and uh, go check it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty fun. Go buy tickets. Tickets. Actually, I think we're, we're raising ticket prices every uh, couple of weeks until fun launch live comes out. Uh, and last year we sold out about a month before we are already ahead of schedule on selling out the event. Okay. Which is pretty crazy. So um, if you guys have not been there, uh, have not bought a ticket yet, we're just going to keep raising. We don't do discounts. We just keep raising prices until the event comes. So, um, all right. Hopefully that was useful. If you guys, if you guys missed the slides, go back and watch the replay of this. If you guys missed the beginning, we did all the training, but y'all are awesome. If you guys can, please like this video. If you get like literally right now, if you got any value, just go like it at the top on the videos page. What this does is it pushes it out to more people and more people can come back and watch the replay. That would help us out and comment down below. If you guys um, like this knowledge, give me like a, give me like a yes or a ooh around the chat. Just anyways, I actually want to see who people that are on here too. 
but go like that. Um, and then uh, we will we keep you in lives like this every week. Um, it's pretty fun. So, okay. Y'all are awesome. Peace out. Go do good in the world. Go help some people out. Y'all are amazing. See you guys later. Bye.